Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to bringing AWS services closer with AWS Outpost and AWS Wavelength. Uh, my name is Rohan Matthews, and I'm the lead architect for the AWS Outpost service. Today, what I'm going to walk you through is an overview of the AWS Outpost service and the AWS Wavelength service. I'm also going to take you through a little bit of a journey on how we develop these services. Um, and how we went through uh, a working backward process with our customers to understand what their needs were and applied that to developing these two services. When we initially started talking to customers about bringing AWS services either on-prem or uh, developing services that customers could use anywhere, uh, customers gave us feedback that they, they really had kind of two big buckets within which their use cases fell that required services to run closer to where they were versus running in the region. Um, one of those buckets, the first bucket, was uh, that their applications were very sensitive to latency. And this latency, latency sensitivity essentially me meant they couldn't move the application away from either the end user or maybe a piece of equipment that it was, it was communicating with. Uh, that, that essentially ruled out being able to use services in the AWS cloud in region. Uh, the second big bucket uh, of feedback we received was that customers had uh, applications and workloads that generated data uh, that had to be processed locally. Uh, so the, think of this as situations where the life of the data really, uh, really was such that transporting the data to AWS would exceed the amount of time it took uh, for the usefulness of the data to be realized. So these customers... Uh, really needed to be able to process the data in place as as they were ingesting it uh, and and get insights from it in in, in very short order. Uh, something else that we uh, we kind of got from our customers in in, in communicating with them about uh, building services that uh, would either run close to where they were or on their premises was uh, that they wanted the same reliable, secure, and high performance infrastructure that AWS runs in 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 uh, the AWS regions. Uh, they wanted the same operational consistency that AWS provides, and they wanted the same API consistency. Uh, seems easy enough, but uh, customers have tried for, for years to try and implement this on their own or implement this through other vendors, and it's been very challenging. Uh, customers also told us they wanted to use the same tools that they use for automation, deployment, and security. Uh, and, of course, um, the customers have told us they've always enjoyed uh, the pace of innovation that AWS brings them. Uh, it helps them innovate uh, and, and, uh, and grow their businesses. And uh, lastly, uh, there's this need for ubiquity, um, being able to use AWS services anywhere, anytime from any device. Uh, so uh, this, was, this was like the, uh, the uh, aggregate, I'd say the, the overall um, message from our customers was we want the same experience across on-premise, the edge, and the cloud. So let's dive into the AWS Outpost service and talk about how we took that customer feedback and we created uh, the service. So the AWS Outpost service brings AWS on-premise. We, we're taking the exact same infrastructure we run in our regions. Uh, that are built on our Nitro system, our AWS Nitro system, and uh, we are deploying this hardware into customers' premises. I like to tell customers the best way to think about this is I take one of the racks in my availability zone, I stick a really long cable on the back of it, and I roll it over into your, into your data center. And that data center could be a data center that you own. It could be a co-location facility. It could be, um, it could be uh, pretty much any premise that can support the footprint for the AWS Outpost. Uh, in addition to providing that, that infrastructure, um, what we're actually doing is providing a fully managed service. What this means is we're going to build the kit, we're going to monitor the kit, we're going to operate the environment for you. We're going to operate that, that AWS Outpost for you. So uh, just, as the, just in the same manner as we do the infrastructure we provide you in the region. On top of all that, we're going to be able to provide a single pane of glass for management. Uh, and that'll help you unify operations in the cloud and on-premise uh, through the service. Let's talk a little bit about what this rack looks like or what the kit looks like. So 
An AWS Outpost rack uh, is the physical element upon which the AWS Outpost service, the logical pieces, are built. Uh, the rack is an industry standard 42U. Uh, it's fully assembled uh, from, our, from our manufacturing facility. Uh, and then an AWS, uh, AWS team will actually perform the installation at your site. Uh, it basically boils down to us plugging in the power, plugging in the network cables, and, uh, and setting up the logical connection back to AWS uh, to bring the outpost online as part of the capacity that, that is dedicated to you. Um, these racks have a centralized power distribution unit. Uh, for high rely for for high availability and and, and high reliability, uh, and uh, we also have redundant active components uh, such as our top of rack switches. Uh, so uh, we've taken the time to to design these uh, in the same manner that that our customers design their environments uh, for high availability, for example. All right. So once we have the rack on site and it's visible in your console. Uh, you you are going to want to go and uh, run services on the outpost. So the outpost is a subset, it runs a subset of services uh, that are available in the region. Um, this kind of this kind of makes sense because we're we're not bringing all of the hardware that we would we would deploy uh, in a region so that you can deploy every single service. We're gonna we're gonna work with you to determine what services you intend on running and are supported on the outpost and then size that outpost accordingly. So it could be one rack, it could be multiple racks. But what you can run locally breaks down into, into a couple of different categories. So uh, we provide compute and storage services in the form of EC2 and EBS. So we provide networking in the form of our VPC services. Um, we provide database services in the form of RDS. Uh, we provide container services such as EKS and ECS. And uh, we provide uh, data processing services like EMR. Now, uh, taking uh, a little bit deeper dive into, into the specifics of these services, um, let's take a look at uh, our, our EC2 and our EBS service. So uh, the AWS Outpost Catalog includes options uh, supporting the latest generation Intel EC2 uh, instances uh, featuring second generation Intel Xeon processors uh, with or without local instance storage. Uh, so you get uh, our C5 instances for compute optimized workload for, for compute optimized workloads. You can get our M5 general purpose instances, our R5 memory optimized instances, uh, our graphics optimized uh, G4DN, uh, or our uh, our I3N uh, storage optimized instances. In addition, uh, Outpost offers local instance storage and EBS block storage in the form of GP2. Uh, persistent block storage. Just as in the region, you can use EBS GP2 volumes for, for boot or data volumes and attach or detach EBS volumes to EC2 instances on your outpost. Uh, it provides uh, snapshots and restore capability and lets you increase volume size without any performance impact. All EBS volumes and snapshots on outpost are fully encrypted by default. Any EBS snapshots uh, will be stored in Amazon S3 in the region. So. Uh, when you take a snapshot today, uh, we copy that snapshot up to a bucket in your account. Uh, and uh, our EBS storage is offered in a couple of tiers. Uh, you, can, you can order 2.7 uh, terabyte tier, 11 terabyte tier, 33 terabyte tier, 55 terabyte tier. And you're not limited to that. You can, you can go well beyond the, that capacity if need be. Okay. Now... Those Intel-powered instances, those Intel-powered EC2 instances provide consistent infrastructure uh, across your on-premise environment and your cloud environment. Uh, it's the same AWS, like I mentioned, it's the same AWS design infrastructure just featuring second generation Intel Xeon uh, scalable processors running on your AWS outpost and as in the AWS region. Uh, so for example, the M5 instance running on, on outpost is powered by a 2.5 gigahertz Intel Xeon processor with Intel Advanced Vector 512 uh, extensions. This offers the same accelerated application performance and significant improvements in workload and speed uh, for data applications uh, on Outpost and in the cloud. Similarly, uh, our, uh, our C5 instances uh, with the computational power of Intel Xeon scalable processors enable customers to create intelligent and innovative new products and experiences 
powered by machine learning. Intel Advanced Vector Extensions 512 accelerate inference and other computationally intensive applications by up to 2x. Your on-premise applications that run on Outpost can seamlessly integrate with the AWS region, providing you a truly consistent hybrid experience. So uh, let's take a look at uh, another one of our services, the RDS service. Uh, the Amazon RDS service on uh, AWS Outpost is in preview right now. Uh, we support MySQL and Postgres uh, database engines uh, with support for additional engines coming soon. Uh, RDS makes it easy to set up, operate, and scale an, a relational database on Outpost in the same way you do in the same way we do it in the cloud. Uh, it provides the same cost uh, cost efficient and resizable capacity, while automating time consuming administration tasks, including uh, infrastructure provisioning, database setup, patching, uh, backups, freeing you to focus on application development. Uh, you can run fully managed databases on premise for low latency workloads that need to be run in close proximity to, uh, to other data sources or other workflows uh, on premise. And you can manage RDS databases both in the cloud and on premise uh, using the same AWS management console, same APIs and the same CLI. Uh, it also enables low cost, high availability hybrid deployments. So with disaster recovery back to the AWS region, for example, you can have read replicas bursting to uh, Amazon RDS in the cloud, and you can you can perform long term archival in S3 for uh, in the cloud. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some other services that are coming soon. So, coming soon in uh, 2020, uh, Amazon S3 for AWS Outpost will enable you to. Uh, oops. Fast forward a little, will enable you to store object data on premises using the S3 API. Uh, all applications running on Outpost will be able to access Amazon S3 in the AWS region, just like they do today. Uh, additionally, workloads that require real time on premise processing or that have uh, premise, like on premise data retention requirements, so think of residency or compliance uh, or for compliance reasons, uh, S3 for Outpost will enable Outpost local data storage. So um, earlier I mentioned uh, when you take a snapshot for EBS, that snapshot gets copied to the region <coughs> into an S3 bucket. When we launch S3 on Outpost, that snapshot can be stored locally, with, uh, locally on the Outpost instead of having to be copied up to the region. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind. S3 and Outpost will, will provide you with the flexible options to control whether your data is stored locally or your data stored in the region. Okay, so that's a little snapshot of the services that are available on Outpost and what's coming. Um, I'd like to talk about the tools that are available to you uh, when running workloads on Outpost. So all Amazon tools uh, will work just, uh, just as well on Outpost as they do in the region. The reason for this is Outpost is connected to the region uh, and all of its management and operations are, are handled through what we call a service link. So um, if you want to use API calls uh, to automatically log uh, CloudTrail events uh, or you have existing cloud formation templates, those will work just the same as they do in the region. Uh, tools such as uh, CloudWatch, uh, for example, uh, and others will run and manage your applications on-premise just the same way as they do in the cloud. Uh, they will have the same security controls such as IAM and VPC permissions, security groups, and access control list. Uh, you can access tools running in the region um, uh, just the same way you do. Uh, you'll actually access tools running in the region. So you'd log into your console and uh, what you, you would log into uh, a tool such as Elastic Beanstalk or Cloud9. And uh, Outpost will just be another resource or resources running on Outpost will just be another resource that you can communicate with and utilize. Now, uh, how are we doing this? Like, uh, how does this all kind of work? How are we seamlessly extending um, services in the region to services on Outpost? Uh, I'll start by explaining kind of how our VPC construct works. So uh, you can seamlessly extend the VPC from the region to on-premise just by creating a subnet and associating it with the Outpost. Um, and once you've created that subnet on Outpost, you can easily launch 
uh, services into that subnet, just as you do in the region today. So instances on the outpost can securely talk to instances in the region uh, via the VPC uh, through private IP addresses. Uh, we can also enable, uh, enable workloads and, and services running on Outpost uh, to use interface endpoints, uh, which are powered by private link, uh, to access regional services uh, like DynamoDB and S3 securely through your VPC. Uh, that's, that's one of those things that this, this capability is one of those things that uh, is really powerful when you think about uh, the amount of work it takes to uh, have a workload running on-prem, communicate with the workload running in the cloud, um, and, and the two workloads not knowing that they're each in a, a, different, uh, a different domain, essentially. So beyond being able to run a workload uh, on an outpost and have it communicate back to something in the region and to one of the availability zones or one of our public services, the the real value in outpost is is being able to to run AWS services on prem and communicate with other things that need to remain on premise. Uh, the way we do this, the way we connect to the local network, is through what we call our local gateway. So you connect to your local network physically uh, via ports on the outpost uh, through our top of rack switches, which we call outpost networking devices. Um, we, we the, our, our techs who actually do the installation, will configure uh, virtual interfaces and provide mappings between your network and, uh, and our outpost. Uh, we support standard protocols for link aggregation, for example, to ensure we have resiliency and, and enough bandwidth between the outpost and, the local, and your local network. And we, we implement standard protocols like LACP. Um, then then we, we provide you with the ability to use the local gateway uh, and, and through, that, through that local gateway, uh, pass traffic from inside your VPCs, and you can have multiple VPCs on the outpost, um, from those VPCs to, to your on-premise uh, infrastructure. So let's say you want a, a host in a VPC on outpost to talk to a storage array, uh, a network attached storage array on-premise. Uh, it, it, with the with the local gateway and uh, by configuring a route table on your outpost, you can allow uh, workloads on the outpost or a host on the outpost to talk to host uh, on your on your local area network, and vice versa. So that brings up that usually when when I when I mentioned that you can now connect uh, your outpost, you can connect workloads as seamlessly as using a, a gateway like the local gateway from the outpost uh, to your on-premise network, I inevitably get a lot of questions about uh, this, how secure uh, an outpost is and who's responsible for it. Earlier I said uh, AWS manages the outpost. It's a managed service. We're responsible for the kit. We're responsible for keeping it, uh, keeping the, the, uh, the uh, service healthy. But um, what, what you need to understand about the service is it actually follows a shared responsibility model similar to how we follow a shared responsibility model in the region. It's just that now the shared responsibility model is a little bit updated because we've moved part of our infrastructure into your environment. And so AWS will continue to be responsible for the outpost infrastructure. So we'll patch uh, the outpost infrastructure. We'll make sure it's secure. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're, how we're doing that in a minute. Um, but customers, customers are still responsible for securing their applications. So running, uh, they have to secure the applications running on Outpost. Customers are also now responsible for the physical security of the Outpost rack. Um, so uh, these, uh, these elements kind of shift. Because we're bringing, uh, bringing our equipment into your environment, our shared responsibility shifts a little bit. In region, we're responsible for the physical security. We're responsible for the security of the rack. We're responsible for logical security through through the hypervisor, and then customers take over from there. So, um, when we look at Outpost, we provide the same controls and the same capabilities of securing your your uh, applications. And so, uh, if you're familiar with how to do that in an AWS region, it will be very familiar to yourself, uh, to you on uh, on the AWS Outpost. 
Okay, so I, I mentioned I was going to go a little bit deeper into that security. Um, what we do in order to ensure that the rack is secure from the time it leaves our facility till the time it gets to yours is we have built-in tamper detection uh, physically on all of the kit. So if somebody pulls pulls a server out and messes with it before it gets to you, we'll know that because we'll we'll check for for uh, we'll check the tamper detection uh, uh, devices and and see whether uh, anything's been compromised, and we won't install that into your environment. Um, we, we make sure that you have a way to lock the doors on the, on the rack. Nobody should be opening and closing the doors. No one should be servicing the rack. Uh, that's really only AWS personnel need to be, um, we need to have access to the rack. Um, by default, data is encrypted on the outpost. Uh, what we've done is we've, we've created a, a capability called uh, a hardware security key. We call it the Nitro security key. And that Nitro security key has an encryption uh, chip on it that ensures that as long as that key is installed, uh, data is accessible on the outpost. If the key is ever pulled out, and it has to be pulled out in order to pull out a server, uh, data is cryptographically shredded at that point and not accessible. And so uh, in, in addition to these physical security, uh, these physical uh, security controls, um, we still have encrypted networks on the logical side connecting our management and data planes uh, between the outpost and the AWS region. Now, to get an outpost, it's, it really is a three-step process, order, install, and launch. We start by taking a look in the outpost catalog and picking a SKU. Uh, these SKUs are pre-baked pre configurations that uh, we think most customers will, will utilize on an outpost. Um, or if you want a custom configuration, you can contact us and we will build a custom configuration for you. This catalog is in your AWS console today. So uh, it, it's very easy for you to go kind of take a look at the catalog and see whether one of these configurations will work for you. Uh, the catalog also provides you information on the power and uh, cooling requirements as well as uh, the overall weight. And uh, you won't see that initially until you, until you select one of the configurations. Um, I mentioned before, once, uh, once we uh, have your order in hand, and we coordinate with you to ensure your site uh, can support the actual device. We call this uh, a site assessment validation. Um, we, AWS, will deliver the uh, outpost in a matter of weeks, and we'll install and configure that outpost for you. And uh, uh, that, that installation could consist of a single rack being installed or multiple racks being installed. OK, so once we've got your kit installed, it's just a matter of going into your console and uh, selecting the outpost that uh, you want to configure a new workload on. Uh, once you've selected the outpost, uh, you need to configure a subnet. I mentioned that before. You need a subnet configured on an outpost in a VPC uh, in the region to which your outpost is connected. Uh, once you've created the subnet, you can now drop workloads onto that subnet. So let's go ahead and see, how, see what that looks like. Um, I've created a subnet on my outpost. Now I'm going through the catalog of uh, available outposts that I have. Um, I've, I'm looking to launch an EC2 instance. Let's launch a Linux instance. And um, you, have, um, you, you can pick from any of the available EC2 instance sizes that we have uh, in our catalog, uh, which are just the same as what we have in the region. So um, once you've selected the EC2 instance size that you want, uh, you configure that instance uh, the same way you would in region. You select the subnet on the outpost as the destination, uh, configure the storage, uh, review, uh, review that uh, configuration, and launch it. Uh, and that's it. Once, uh, once you've launched that instance, uh, it will spin itself up on the outpost on that capacity that's, that's just been installed in your environment. It's uh, really that simple. All right, so that was outpost. Uh, now I'm going to take you through kind of a brief uh, rundown on our Wavelength service. So what I'm showing here is a typical end-to-end -end network. Uh, users are connected over cell towers uh, of fix or fixed lines um, through proprietary CSPs. These are communication service providers' networks uh, to transit or peering points, which then connect them to the public internet, which in turn connects them to the AWS region. So this, as you can see, this trip, this round trip is pretty expensive. It could be a significant round trip between a user and uh, an AWS region. Uh, now let's, let's introduce into this kind of the 5G edge. So 
latency perceived by an application in a region today depends on where the users are. So where the region is, uh, is and the specific paths traversed uh, to the application in the regions all affects the latency the user experiences. So typical latency would be in the hundreds of milliseconds. So if you look across uh, like a big population of subscribers, however, like compute instances running at a site embedded in a CSP network, uh, for example, is very close to the end user, uh, both geographically, but more importantly, uh, from, a, from an overall network distance. And latency can be in the tens of milliseconds uh, and even getting into the lower digits, uh, depending on the specific uh, site and the network connectivity. All right, so this is just, uh, I'm just going to kind of build this out so you see where a wavelet zone would sit. So wavelet zones are, again, the same infrastructure, uh, uh, the same AWS design infrastructure as we run in our regions. They're hosted uh, in a site within the CSP network, uh, and they're managed and monitored uh, from an AWS region. Uh, Plus, they're integrated uh, into CSP 5G networks. Uh, so this, this provides some unique um, advantages to customers uh, in that they, they could technically access an AWS capabilities anywhere they have 5G, 5G uh, service. So how, how, do we, how do we go about doing this? So we start by building these wavelength zones. We will, we will start by building these wavelength zones across various markets in the next, in the next year or so. And, Let's just look kind of at the U.S. So we'll pick a market uh, such as metro area where customers want to develop applications, um, and they are close to 5G, and they they're close to 5G users in, in a metropolitan area. We'll partner with uh, a CSP, and we'll deploy a wavelength zone into the CSP network, and that's what I'm showing here. Uh, and and kind of as uh, as customer demand uh, dictates and uh, new use cases come about, we'll be able to deploy wavelength zones uh, in many different locations. And these wavelength zones will still be managed by, um, will still be managed by uh, an AWS region. They'll be connected to an AWS region. So um, running a workload in, in the region and one, running a workload in, in uh, a wavelength zone and having those workloads talk to each other will be pretty seamless. But now you can decide which pieces to put close to the edge, close to those users that need low latency and what pieces can run back in the region. All right, and, and we're not just partnering with, uh, with CSPs in, in the US, we're also partnering with CSPs around the world to create a large global footprint at the 5G edge, at the 5G network edge. So uh, let's take a look at how application is deployed on, on an outpost. So uh, let's just do a little bit of a deeper dive. So we, we have what we call uh, a new gateway called the carrier gateway. And uh, this carrier gateway, uh, which customers can use to interface with various uh, CSP endpoints, these could be 5G networks or even other CSP networks. Uh, they could also be a point in the CSP network that has ingress and egress to the internet, for example. So what we do is our command management and monitoring uh, between the AWS region and the wavelength is set up in a similar manner to how I explained that management between an outpost and a and a, a region to which customer wants to manage their outpost from is, is configured. Uh, so workloads can be extended between the region and the outpost by extending the VPC between. Uh, oh, sorry, w w workloads can be extended between a wavelet zone <laughs> and 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 the region by extending the VPC in the same way you extend uh, the uh, the VPC uh, for an outpost, uh, and then. Uh, end users can connect to that wavelength zone through the carrier gateway, and that'll be via uh, something like a 5G mobile network. Uh, once, once the customer is connected to that through the carrier gateway to the wavelength zone, they can then access other AWS uh, endpoints, regional endpoints, through that same carrier gateway. They because the carrier ha will have a, a path by which they can reach the internet and reach the internet facing endpoints uh, at the, on the AWS region. And then uh, the wavelength zone and servers outside, like they can still access from the wavelength zone, they can, customers can still access service outside of the wavelength zone uh, on the internet, just like, uh, just like they do in, uh, from an AWS region today. Okay, so in practice, Let's talk about a gaming company. So we, we have a gaming customer uh, who wants to deploy uh, a game, and we have four players that are moderately distributed uh, around uh, around the country. 
or around the location to which the gaming server is deployed. Uh, our our gaming customer has decided to deploy. Uh, they've tried to deploy out in the AWS regions and realized that the regions are just a little too far from from their clients to provide the proper experience for that game. So they've decided they're going to deploy that game server in into a wavelength zone. And when they look at the total round trip time and response from each of their clients, each of the, each of the, cust- uh, each of the uh, players, essentially, what, what, what the players experience is much better round trip time, much better response in game. And uh, just kind of clicking into it a little further uh, to, to give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, in, in, some, in some cases, we're cutting the latency uh, in half. So we're improving the slowest play, player's performance uh, by cutting that latency in half, and we're reducing latency the, the entire latency band by up to sixty six percent. So it's it's a more it's just more predictable from uh, from an overall game server perspective as far as how they serve uh, various uh, various uh, players that are connecting. Uh, and the the average latency is cut in half. So so like I mentioned, everything is much more responsive than than the players connecting to different uh, different uh, servers or or one player kind of slowing everything down because of it, because of, of that player having extremely high latency uh, in game. So that that should give you kind of an idea of like a, a real a real use case and 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 something that uh, and one of the one of the ways uh, customers can benefit from wavelength zones. Um, a few other use cases, and, I, and these are both for wavelength zones and for for uh, for outpost is. Uh, we're seeing a lot of emerging interactive applications. So think of uh, virtual reality type applications and uh, like real time rendering, um, where you need single millisecond uh, latency in order for the rendering to uh, to uh, occur and and not uh, not disrupt the overall experience. Uh, and and it's hard for users to be um, to have. It may be difficult for users to have sufficient bandwidth or low enough latency to for that experience to. Uh, to be uh, feasible from a from a region, an AWS region, for example, but running on a local zone or, or, or a wavelength zone or, or a an outpost uh, could enable that um, that experience. Uh, a second use case we're seeing is edge processing. So think of uh, smart cities applications. These are uh, IoT type of uh, use cases for industrial automation. Um, we see uh, we have customers telling us that. Uh, they see a number of use cases in this space uh, for for these two services as well. And a third use case is machine learning at the edge. Um, today, devices are constrained by CPU, memory, power, and need to perform analytics in real time uh, for solutions such as like self driving cars. Um, high latency uh, becomes uh, can can create um, kind of a dangerous situation for a self driving car if it can't communicate with. Uh, with its edge uh, for maybe telemetry or some other some other check in that it may have to do, uh, but with uh, with the abilities uh, with, with having access to something like wavelength uh, or outpost, uh, this processing can occur can occur at the edge on um, like I mentioned the same Intel uh, Intel Xeon processors that we use in region. So. Uh, these are. This is just a snapshot of what what our customers are telling us they they're thinking about using. And so, uh, if you want to learn more, um, we actually have uh, uh, we have training uh, on our website uh, where you can go take a look at um, uh, and get a deeper dive into the into our services. Um, if you're ready to continue learning, uh, check out our library of free digital courses, uh, including introductory primers uh, on a range of services, uh, not just Outpost, not just uh, Wavelength. You can also take classroom training and hands on uh, and get hands on practice and learn dr- directly from our instructors. Uh, so visit uh, the learning library for a full list of those courses. And um, thank you for the time today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you giving me the time and coming to hear about uh, our outpost and wavelength services.